my uh, slides. We good, Craig? All right, thank you. OK, so today I'm going to talk about the sensitivity of steric sea level rise to oceanic diapycnal mixing. Um, this is something that's building on work that we've been doing off and on for, for more than a decade. And many people have contributed to this work. Um, I'd particularly like to, to single out Angelique Millet, who is my co-author on, on the, the second uh, half of the work that I'm going to be presenting today. So uh, I'm getting an echo, Craig. OK, we're good. So last year's IPCC special report on the oceans and cryosphere in a changing climate did a nice job of summarizing a lot of the, the changes that we can expect in the, the marine and cryosphere environments. Um, and the, the evidence here is really compelling that we are observing and we are able to model that the cryosphere is shrinking, the oceans are warming, acidifying, expanding, becoming more heavily stratified, losing oxygen, and we're seeing significant changes in biological ranges. Um, all of these have been now observationally documented, they're accelerating, and they're broadly consistent with the CMIP-5 coupled model historical simulations. Now these CMIP-5 models are from a few years ago, um, about five years ago, and, and there's a new IPCC report that's going to come out next year with the, the next generation of coupled models. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking about some results from the, the previous ones. Now, notably, a lot of these changes in the 21st century are committed. They will be happening, but we do have agency in how much and how quickly these will be changing as we go forward. And among those changes, one of the more prominent is rising sea levels. Um, this is something that's observationally documented and affects coastal communities and ecosystems uh, around the world. For now, the leading contributor to sea level rise is basically a warming ocean, warming and expanding ocean that we can observationally quantify the, the changes in the ocean heat content. And this is, has been until very recently the, the single largest contributor although the ice sheet loss from Greenland and Antarctica combined with the glacier, mountain glacier ice loss, have collectively kind of passed the ocean heat content within the last couple of years. Um, now, if you look at, at these various contributors to, to sea level rise, um, especially as we go out into the, the far distant future, a lot of the uncertainty comes from uncertainties about how much um, ice will be lost from, from grounded glaciers and how quickly they might melt. This is where all the fat tails of, of really precipitous sea level rise um, might be in, in the statistical distribution. But for the coming few decades, ocean heat content and related steric sea level rise are still going to be a dominant contributor. And even there, although we know much more about this than we do about some of the changes in the in the cryosphere, even there, there are some significant uncertainties. And I'm going to talk about those uncertainties today. Now, if you think about people living near the coast, there are a whole lot of different responses that people can have to sea level rise. Uh, essentially, you can just let it happen and lose stuff, or you can invest in protecting yourself um, putting up barriers of some sort, uh, accommodating sea level rise by raising houses. Anybody who's been to the uh, down to the Jersey Shore in the last couple of years has seen a lot of houses up on stilts. You can also advance, claim new land in front of the existing um, beachfront, move forward. You can retreat. You can basically move things inland or replace them with things inland. Or you can use um, something that's often much more cost effective when it works, use ecosystem based adaptation, dunes or allowing um, uh, marshes and, and seagrasses and things like that to, to build in mangroves, to build in as barriers against a rising sea level. The thing is that all of these are expensive to some degree or another, and they all have a finite lifetime as, as sea levels will continue to rise. But for many purposes, it's the rate of sea level rise that determines which of these alternatives are going to be practical and cost effective. Essentially, the rate of sea level rise is what determines how much lead time you have to plan and execute whatever adaptations you're going to make. 
and it's also this rate of sea level rise that will determine how long these adaptations are good for. And so if you're thinking about changing your infrastructure, this is expensive, but if your lifetime of your infrastructure is um, going to be exceeded by the time scale upon which uh, sea level rise becomes becomes big issue uh, for it, then you're okay. If if sea level is rising more quickly, that effectively shortens the lifetime of whatever solutions you have. And so for a lot of purposes, knowing how quickly sea level rise is going to happen in, in the coming decades is, is going to be determinative of what the right course of action might be. It's also worth noting that a number of marine ecosystems are at risk as a result of climate change. And this is this is this burning embers diagram that kind of qualitatively highlights which ecosystems are, are particularly in trouble from warming and associated acidification of the ocean. But sea level rise is actually a particular risk for a number of ecosystems at the margins, including mangrove forests and, and salt marshes, um, where they're essentially at sea level, and as sea level rises, they can accommodate that, provided it's slow enough. And the way they accommodate that is by building up sediments, growing taller, or, or in the case of, say, forests, migrating either uh, inland towards, towards uh, shallow areas. But again, it's the rate of sea level rise that's going to determine whether natural systems can adapt to the rising sea levels. So for all of these, um, both human and natural impacts of climate change through sea level rise, there's, an, there's a high premium to having a, a, a good un, uh, quantification of our uncertainty in the, the rates of sea level rise. Now, we use ensembles of coupled climate models to project forward what we think the um, consequences of climate change will be. But whereas in the atmosphere, it is often the case that the average across all the models has a very small bias compared to any individual model. And therefore, the ensemble mean is, is something close to an unbiased predictor of what we might expect. That's actually not true in the ocean in the coupled models that made up the CMIP-5 ensemble. Um, this figure shows the zonal mean temperature bias averaged over the ensemble of about 35 coupled models. And one of the things you'll, you'll see is, although the biases at the surface are relatively small, there's this fairly significant bias in the kind of the lower main thermocline of the oceans. In other words, this is, this is water that's warmest at the surface. It gets colder as you go down. But the depth over which it cools is uh, occurring over a larger scale than is observed in the real world. In other words, we, they have an, an excessively broad uh, thermocline. And this is something that could be consistent with adding added diapycnal diffusion. It's not something that modelers have put in deliberately, but because so many of these models use traditional Z-coordinate um, formulations, they can't precisely control just how much mixing uh, they're putting in because of the numerics, because of the truncation errors, mostly in the evective uh, schemes of the models. And we can quantify this. This is a, a paper going back about a decade. We can quantify this by looking at how much um, uh, the change in the reference potential energy of the mean state of uh, the ocean when we turn off uh, diapycnal diffusion. And this is a comparison here between uh, one of GFTL's Z coordinate models at, at say one degree resolution versus a, a, a density coordinate model. Ideally, the rate at which you're doing work, you're evolving the, the state of the ocean, is going to be uh, dictated by physical considerations. However, by adding diffusion and, and this uh, change in the reference potential energy very strongly as we change the explicit diffusion in the model, it increases. Um, as we increase that explicit diffusion, we see that this metric of mixing changes. But for traditional Z-coordinate models, there's a, a numerical background. Even when you put in no explicit mixing, 
that is about a third of the energy that's going into the physical mixing in, in the real ocean. And as we go to higher resolutions, this can become quite large and actually exceed the, the physical mixing that we ought to get. Um, we are able to control this by reformulating our ocean models. Uh, in particular, one of the things we've been working on with, with MOM6, the, our latest generation of, uh, of the MOM models at, at GFDL, is using a, a, something we're calling a, a vertical Lagrangian mat remapping method so that we can uh, use the same equations, the same formulation to uh, basically capture any vertical coordinate we want. And by using coordinate surfaces that are able to move with the fluid, we're able to minimize the, the diapicnal mixing. And there's a, there's a whole literature, I'm happy to talk much more about this, but the illustration of how well this works comes from um, two different variants of our latest um, CM4 coupled model. What I'm showing here is the, uh, a time series as a function of depth of the horizontal mean temperature drift of, of a, a traditional, this is the same numerics, but one of them is emulating a, a Z coordinate, going back to, to flat surfaces every, every time step, compared with a hybrid isopycnal Z coordinate model. And the, the, the drift in this model is dramatically reduced just by changing the, the vertical coordinate. Um, this, this hybrid Z um, to, to density coordinate model still has more drift than we'd like, and we're, we're working on, on pushing this um, closer to some of the isopycnal coordinate models we've used in the past. But I think this is a very clear illustration that despite the fact that these have identical parameterizations, identical atmospheres, identical sea ice, identical land sea mass, everything else, the only thing that differs is the vertical coordinate. And in this case, we're following density surfaces in the interior of the ocean. And then as we get up to the close to the surface, um, they're, they're following pressure, pressure surfaces just this change in the vertical coordinate can have a significant impact on how much the model drifts, how much heat it up, up takes, and, and what its effective diapicnal diffusion is. Okay, so the outline of what I'm gonna talk about today it is really covering two uh, different pieces of work. Um, the former is here to kind of motivate the latter. Um, the first one is looking at these, at two coupled cl climate models that differ only in their ocean components. One of them is based on a, a Z coordinate model, the other based on a density coordinate model, uh, showing that there's a significant sensitivity in the projections from these two models of, of 21st century steric sea level rise. And then based on that comparison, which tentatively fingered differences in, in the diapicnal diffusion, um, I'm going to show you some sensitivity studies where we're deliberately changing the diapicnal diffusivity in, in one of these two models, the one that doesn't exhibit much uh, numerical diffusion. Um, and then I'll have some, some comments about the implications for the uncertainties in our collective projections of, of climate change. Now, it's worth noting here that I'm talking about diapicnal diffusion, but we all know or many of us think that the way that heat gets into the ocean is not by diffusing downward, but by being advected in um, along density surfaces, largely adiabatically from, from the surface. And so the role of diapicnal diffusion here is not a direct diffusive signal. It's not the dominant signal, but instead it acts by reshaping the pathways for the advection and uh, by changing the, the properties uh, of the ocean so that things like the, the thermal expansion coefficient um, have, have changed significantly. Okay. So the two models I'm looking at, these are both about 10 years old. Um, they have the same atmosphere. They're both about one degree resolution um, with a, a tripolar grid. The big difference between the two is that, that one of them uses an isopycnal interior uh, with, with a couple of um, variable density mix layers. The other is using a Z coordinate model. And as I showed before, the isopycnal coordinate version exhibits far less unconstrained numerical diapicnal diffusion than does the, the, the Z coordinate model. 
But there's a long list on both of these just to make the point that this isn't the only difference between the two. The oceans are the only thing that differ, but within the oceans, there are a number of differences. And so I'll come back uh, to the, the study later where we're using exactly the same model. It's just, um, but changing only the background diffusion and doing it with the isopycnal coordinate uh, model so that we don't have uh, too much numerical background, uh, new implicit mixing contaminating the signal. So if we look at these two models, we've spun those, both of the models up for well over 2,000 years. Um, these are Earth system models, so they're predicting the chlorophyll. Um, we basically ran them with pre-industrial forcing, and then starting in 1860, we started driving them with historical forcing anomalies, the greenhouse gases. We had aerosols, volcanoes, solar variability. Um, they have interactive land use uh, starting in 1860. And between the two, um, they're both reasonably good climate models for this CMIT-5 vintage. They have pretty similar bias patterns. It's not entirely surprising given that they have the same atmosphere with just kind of a slightly cooler um, surface properties for the for uh, the ESM2G, the, the isopycnal coordinate model, compared with the Z coordinate model. Um, in both cases, we prescribed the atmospheric CO2 concentrations but then ran an Earth system model and inverted the, the budget for the net CO2 emissions that would be required. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, some things we just can't control. Um, so we basically inverted to figure out how many, how much, what the CO2 emissions would have to be to follow the, the radiative pathways. Um, and they differ about by about 9% with, uh, with more carbon being taken up by the, the Z coordinate model. Um, but they're basically very similar at the surface. But if you look in the interior ocean, there are some pretty significant differences in the, the biases of these two models. The, the ESM2M is basically got a much uh, warmer interior ocean. It's got a broader uh, main thermocline. ESM2G, the isopycnal coordinate model, if anything, has an overly sharp uh, main, main thermocline. And so these two models kind of bracket what you might expect of, of a perfect model uh, to look like. This is in the Pacific. In the Atlantic, the, the story is a little bit um, more complicated because there are differences in the AMOC. AMOC goes uh, a bit more deeply in the isopycnal coordinate model. But again, you're seeing this, this broad tendency for the the Z coordinate model to be significantly warmer than the um, than the isopycnal coordinate model, and this is something that emerged very slowly over the thousands of years of, of spin up. Although both of them are, are in near equilibrium state at the end of the the uh, at the start of, of of the runs, and so if we look at the steric sea level rise between these two models. What we see is they're both agreeing reasonably well with the observed historical trends, and they they show similar patterns through the historical period. We see significant drops in steric sea level rise associated with with uh, major volcanoes. So this is Krakatoa, um, this is Agong, here's Pinatubo, right? So both of them are kind of exhibiting a lot of similarities. And yet, as we look at the projections going forward, there's a systematic difference between these two models, where the, the Z coordinate model, ESM2M, is exhibiting about an eight, a systematic 18% larger steric sea level rise than ESM2G. Um, it takes up about 9% more heat in these um, scenario runs going forward, and that takes it up over a greater depth the, the thermal expansion coefficient is, is a function of temperature and pressure. So if you take up heat at greater depth, that tends to increase the steric sea level rise. But a lot of this is also due to the fact that the model was simply warmer at the end of the spin-up. And we can see that here. So these are the horizontal mean ocean temperature profiles in the models averaged over the 20-year the period from the 80s to, to the year 2000. 
compared with the observed state here in the in the dashed line. And so there's there's a systematic difference between the two uh, models where one of the two models is, is warmer by about about a degree to a degree and a half broadly over the depth of the ocean. But of particular importance is is this kind of lower main thermocline where a lot of the heating is is taking place on the, the sort of decadal to centennial time scales of, a, of the, the climate change uh, runs. And so we're seeing this systematic difference between these two models. And yet, if we look at the sea surface temperature, there's the, the both of the models are, are predicting changes that are, in, in some cases, cases, really quite similar to one another. In other cases, this is, um, these are ensembles of runs and, and averages over the ensembles, but there's still some noise. But they're broadly similar in the sea surface temperature trends. Um, but if we look at the volume mean ocean temperature, there's systematically about 9% more warming in one case uh, than there are the other. And you can see this in uh, the, the zonal mean um, here, this is the Atlantic on, on top, and, and the Pacific is where you see it more more clearly, um, where there's there's just similar changes in the upper part of the water column, but as you move deeper into the lower main thermocline, we see significant differences, and that's uh, something we can see here in the the zonal. Uh, these are the horizontal means. So the temperature changes here. There's there's a bit more of this temperature change. The the dash. Uh, the chain dot line here is from RCP 8.5. Very similar changes in the in the upper part of the water column, but as we get kind of into the lower main thermocline and into the intermediate waters, there's a systematic difference of of some fraction of a degree between uh, these two models. And we can look at the the contributions that this makes to uh, steric sea level rise. And it's, it's really this, this depth range between about 200 meters and, and about 1,500 meters that is, is contributing to the differences between the two models. And we can further break this down looking at the contributions from the various terms. So um, you can look at the changes in the, in the, the uh, temperature anomalies acting on the mean thermal expansion coefficient. We can look at the, the salinity uh, changes acting on the mean haline contraction coefficient. And then we can also look at the anomalies in the blue line here in the thermal expansion coefficient, but for the, the average of the temperature change between these two models. And so a lot of the signal that we're seeing in the difference in the, the sea level rise is simply as a result of the fact that the thermal expansion coefficient is a function of temperature. Now you can see that the, the depth ranges over which this is, is really prominent in this figure. The, the top two panels show the temperature changes by the year 2100 with the RCP 8.5 uh, strongly forced scenario. The top 400 meters, these are broadly similar. There are some differences in patterns and detail, but broadly similar. But if you look uh, deeper down in the water column between say 800 and 1200 meters, you can see this very large systematic difference where the Z coordinate model here on the right is exhibiting much more warming, especially in the Pacific than, than the isopycnal coordinate model. In the Atlantic, where we have the overturning circulation, this is being directly advected in from the, from the north being swept down. The differences aren't quite so large, although even here, we're still seeing a systematic difference where the, the Z coordinate model is exhibiting more warming in this lower main thermocline than is the isopycnal coordinate model. Now, everything I've talked about here, it's, it's kind of circumstantial evidence that it's diapycnal diffusion that's, that's causing the differences. These two models exhibit significant differences, but they also had uh, differences other than just the diapycnal diffusion. And so we have a, a separate study that we did following up on that paper, where we said, okay, let's take one of these two models, CM2G. Um, it, it differs only from the ESM2G that we saw before in that we've prescribed the chlorophyll concentrations to reproduce the annual cycle 
from the Earth system model, and we're not carrying around um, the whole Earth system model. It, it about doubles the cost to carry around the, the 30 or so biological tracers that we had in the Earth system model. We took this model and we spun it up to near equilibrium with six different values of diapycnal diffusivity that we added on, ranging from zero up to 0 0.8 centimeters squared per second. Um, the, the background, the explicit background that we were using in, in the main thermocline is about 0.2 centimeters squared per second. And so this is, this red line is roughly doubling that background. It's also worth noting here that this, we took the model and the model predicts its own diffusivity in a lot of cases. It's a function of stratification where you put in, say, energy at the bottom and then the conversion from energy to diffusivity is done by the Osborne relationship. Um, in this case, when we add the diffusivity, it can cause a change in the stratification and so it can change what the model was predicting, but we're just adding in this diffusivity after all the other calculations are done. Um, so it's not exactly this difference in the diffusivity, but think of this as the perturbation that we're applying to the model, and then the other changes are, are part of the response. So we ran these out with each one of these added diffusivities for, for some 2,000 years, by which point all of these models are, are close to equilibrium. And then we took that as the starting point for a whole series of idealized climate change runs where we increase the, the, the CO2 by 1% per year to four times the pre-industrial value. But we're doing this using initial conditions from each one of these six cases, but combining them with different values of the added diffusivities. So it's all color coded. These are what we're seeing here on the right. These are from the control runs. And so you can see, for instance, the, the, the pink line here um, is near equilibrium. We didn't change the diffusivity. It carries on. Uh, whereas the case down here with the blue line where we added no diffusivity, the volume in ocean uh, temperature increases starting at the start of the control run in exactly the way that it did when we started the, the, the perturbation, right? So we've gone from six long spin ups and then we did all of the permutations of the added diffusivity. So we have a total of 36 uh, climate change runs that we're doing here, plus 36 control runs with an identical history of the added diffusivity. Um, so we're subtracting that out. And then we, we went a little bit further in that we also repeated this after one or two centuries. So we actually have three ensembles of, of each of these suites that, that all figure figure into this. And this gives us a pretty statistically robust signal. So at the end of, uh, say, first 200 years of, of spin up, you can see that adding these various levels of the diffusivity is leading to a, a warming of the ocean concentrated up here in the, the main thermocline. So after after a couple of centuries, it's it's um, mostly the upper ocean that's, that's changed. And the heat is not necessarily being just advected in. Instead, as we add the diffusion, it's spreading out this thermocline, it's changing the advective pathways so that heat can be advected in following pathways that are being modified by the diffusion. It's not just the direct downward diffusion of heat. It's the advection of heat acting in concert with the diffusion that, that's operating. And then after a, a long time, some, some 2,000 years, you can see that this, this heating is uh, broadly distributed throughout much of, of, of the ocean, but it's still concentrated up here in the, in the main thermocline. It's largest near the surface. And you can see that here in a cross section in, in the Pacific. So the, the warming here is initially broadening the, the main thermocline up here in, in kind of the, the tropics and the mid, mid latitudes, but it's also causing uh, changes in, in the formation of, of, of bottom waters. Um, and over time, this heating of the main thermocline, this water is being upwelled it changes the properties at the surface that are then being downwelled, say, in, in the Southern Ocean. 
but that plays out initially on time scales of order a couple hundred years in the, the main thermocline and thousands of years going into to much, uh, thousands of years to go much deeper into the ocean. The time scales that we're most interested in for um, a lot of questions related to climate change are of order a couple hundred years. We'll often do um, historical runs from 1850 through to 2100. That's that's a 250 year time scale. So a lot of the action on those time scales is concentrated up in the near the surface and in the main thermocline, taking much longer to penetrate more deeply into the ocean. Uh, hi, Bob. Sorry, oh, sorry. To yeah. Uh, we have uh, a we have question, a question from, from Allegra, Allegra in, the chat. in the chat. Oh, I can't see the chat. Could you I please read it to me? Or, or Allegra, um, are you happy to uh, ask a question? Uh, uh, sure. So I was wondering how sensitive this result is to changes in surface buoyancy forcing, and specifically, um, you know, thinking about it, uh, once you have four times CO2, you have a lot of enhanced rainfall on high latitude uh, river catchment basins, increased uh, P minus E, and also melting from Greenland, um, right. which makes a pretty significant surface buoyancy uh, forcing. And it did in the GIST model, and it, I would expect, depending on what that background state is of your model, it, this change in mixing would have more or less of an effect. So did you play around with that at all? Um, well, so there, there are a couple of ways to think about this. First, this is a fully coupled model. And, and one of the points you make is that the amplification of the hydrological cycle is one of the big signals in climate change, and that's, that's here. So some of the changes we're seeing, you would never get from an ocean-only model. These are fully coupled response. Now, Greenland, we have a surface mass budget in Greenland, but we don't have a dynamic ice sheet. So if you think that Greenland starts to, to move and calve, that's not included, but but net melting of the net fresh water budget from the surface mass budget is, is included in in both of these models. For your question of how, how robust are these, I think that the signals we're seeing are reasonably robust, um, that you could probably add them somewhat linearly with uh, with some of the other changes, for instance, driven by the by the hydrologic cycle in 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 the Arctic. Although, of course, some parts of this are you know, it is a fully coupled system. There are nonlinearities that that are important. I think that qualitatively they're they're reasonably robust. I expect them to be useful across models. But exactly the sorts of nonlinearities that you're talking about are why we try to build models that incorporate as much as possible of our understanding of, of the, the dynamics of the ocean and, and the processes underlying um, mixing. So, um, right. Thanks. Yeah. So these are the, the interior ocean changes. The surface changes are in some ways even more interesting. So after we increase the diffusivity, what we see over the first few decades is a broad cooling, mostly in the tropics, and that's because that's where the stratification, the thermal stratification is largest. And essentially by adding a diapectal diffusion, we're drawing heat from the near surface and, and into the interior ocean. And so we initially see this, this broad cooling. At higher latitudes where the stratification was weaker, we don't really see much. But over the course of a few decades, something really interesting is happening. We're seeing warming emerging at high latitudes, especially in, in the Atlantic and on much longer time scales in, in the Southern Ocean as well. And then that's spreading in the atmosphere so that the, the, the zonal bands here, this is mostly associated with an increase in the in AMOC, transporting more heat northward, but then it's being distributed uh, from the Atlantic in, into the Pacific sector is kind of how we're thinking, thinking of this. And then on longer time scales, because you're warming the lower main thermocline, that's the water that's upwelling in the Southern Ocean. Um, and so you're seeing a signal that changes from cooling to warming. The thing that's really surprising about this is the ocean is continuing to warm, even though the sea surface temperature has warmed. If you're doing this with an ocean-only model, it wouldn't work this way at all, because you basically have a just a negative feedback if you want to make the ocean warmer, you do so by making the surface colder. 
if you want to make the interior warmer, you do something like making the surface colder. Instead, what's happening here is we're transporting heat downward via the diffusion, advecting it back up in, in mid latitudes and high latitudes where it's having feedbacks with, with the, the ice. It's melting back the ice. You have positive feedbacks from the ice albedo feedback and, and then also changes in the atmospheric circulation and the clouds that are amplifying things. And so what started off here as an initial cooling over time becomes quite a significant warming. Now there, if you do things the other way, so you start off with a warm initial condition and then you make your diffusivity colder, you see the same thing happening in reverse. Although the time scales here are interestingly different. The, the starting from a warm state and then cooling, we're seeing a, a response that, that switches signs um, on the global mean uh, after after a little less than a century, whereas for the case where we started off with low diffusivity, add diffusivity, that takes a longer time scale of a couple of centuries. So there's there's an interesting hysteresis uh, associated with this, but this is this is a signal that is entirely due to the fact that this is a fully coupled model, freely able to evolve its its state. The only thing we're doing is we're just adding in this this extra diffusivity. Um, and you can see that this response is, is as pretty quick uh, in the AMOC. So what I've got here for each one of these added diffusivities is the, the time series of the 25 year averaged uh, AMOC at 27 degrees north, at 30 degrees south, and then the implied upwelling between the two. And you can see that the, the implied upwelling, um, there's about a three sphere difference between these, this, this range of added diffusivities um, and then that's associated with an increased strength in the AMOC initially just in the, the northern hemisphere, but eventually the, the transport coming into the Atlantic at 30 south from, from the other ocean basins uh, also increases, albeit on a, a longer time scale. So that this is a fully coupled uh, response that we're, we're looking at, and there are very interesting parts of this that are largely uh, advective. Now, as a part of these changes, we're also changing the thermal expansion coefficient. So this is now the, the Pacific, this is the zonal mean state without any added diffusivity. And then after 2000 years with this added diffusivity, you can see that there's a, a significant warming of this, the main thermocline, especially in, in the Pacific, but also at, at depth. But if you say, well, what is the fractional change in the thermal expansion coefficient? And I've got the, the mean state thermal expansion coefficient here in the top right. It's a function of pressure. So the thermal expansion coefficient increases with pressure. It's also a function of temperature. And so it's, it's largest at warm temperatures and gets very small uh, for, for temperatures that get close to the freezing point. This warming that we're seeing here leads to significant changes in the thermal expansion coefficient, especially in the main thermocline where you have this kind of overlap of, of a relatively low, because it's cold, but the pressure isn't so high, um, mean state thermal expansion coefficient, but it's also being overlaid by significant temperature changes. And then very large changes in the thermal expansion coefficients in, in high latitudes, where the temperatures in this case warmed significantly away from from the freezing point. In terms of the global mean sea level rise signal, it's really this, this main thermocline, especially in the Pacific Ocean, just because it's the biggest, where we're seeing a lot of the heat changes and significant changes in the thermal expansion coefficients that are gonna give us differences between the two models. Okay, and so when we take all of these different cases and you use the same diffusivity added diffusivity during the spin-up and during the climate change experiments, what we're seeing here is a, a pretty clear and systematic increase in the volume mean temperature change after 200 years of this idealized four times CO2 run, uh, and a larger fractional change in the, the, the steric sea level rise. So this is, there are three ensemble members in, in each one of these cases, and you can see that this is a, a pretty significant and pretty robust uh, result that you can quantify. Interestingly, if we go back to the cases um, and say, okay, how much added diffusivity would you need to get the ensemble mean bias 
from the, the CMIP cases, that's giving you something of order about 0.2 times 10 to the minus fourth meter squared per second would give you about the right magnitude of bias. And so one of the sig one of the things that you might do is you could say, well, I know there's a bias because the models are too warm. If I tried to subtract out the effects related to that bias, what would that mean for sea level rise? And this is suggesting something of order, 20% differences in the sea level rise in the ensemble mean. Individual models will be higher and lower, but because so many of the models have very similar biases, it suggests that the ensemble mean forecast is also biased. Now, the other thing that we did here is we said, okay, that's just changing the diffusivity, but let's try to tease this apart a little bit because one of the things that you might do, even if you had a model that was biased, you could initialize it from something close to observations and then just let it drift. Uh, and hopefully the fact that you're close to the initial conditions might make it a viable climate model. And so what I've done here is we took each one of these six test cases and now we're spinning them up with the, the same atmospheric forcing, these are the control runs, but using now each of the other six diffusivities, right? So we've gone from six cases to 36 cases. And so this is like introducing a, a biased climate model, but with a, a perfect spin up or a data assimilative spin up or something uh, as a way to kind of differentiate between the biases that accumulated over time during the spin up versus the things associated with the drift during the, the, the climate change run. So this is, these are the control runs, volume mean ocean temperature. We also then took and did a 1% per year to four times CO2 runs. Uh, and again, looking at the, the volume mean ocean temperature. And if you look at the change in, in this case relative to the initial conditions, you can see that there, things are fairly broad. They're all over the map. Um, and there's not really a systematic difference. But if we do the right thing and subtract off the control run with the same history of added diffusivities, then we're finding we're collapsing down to something where these are broadly similar in that they're able to reproduce this, this climate change run. But there's a systematic difference here between the lower diffusivity and the higher diffusivity cases. And so this is really the signal that we're going to analyze. So I like to use these for audiences that haven't seen much climate change. I don't need to do this for GIS, obviously, uh, but emphasizing the importance of, of subtracting off control runs uh, as a way of teasing out the climate signal. And so this is this is what we get where I, I'm plotting the added uh, steric sea level rise as a function on the x-axis of how much added diffusivity I use during the spin up. And then the, in the, the left panel, the colored lines are for different values of the div added diffusivity during the climate change run itself. And, and then on the right, I've, I've flipped the axis and the line coloring so that the, the horizontal axis is the added diffusivity during the climate change run. And then the lines are um, the different levels of the diffusivity that we use during the, the spin up. And so the, the point here is that adding diapicnal diffusion increases the steric sea level both by increasing the rate of heat uptake and by warming the ocean. In other words, the warmer water expands more when it's heated. That change in the thermal expansion coefficient is, is pretty significant. But both the initial conditions that we used and the mixing during the run are contributing significantly uh, to these cases. And so we can do a, a bivariate correlation of the steric sea level rise and the temperature change. These were at after 200 years, but we can do this for a, a whole series of, of 20 year periods. And we can look at how much of the signal is being uh, explained by these two contributions, adding diffusivity during the spin up, in other words, the initial conditions, or adding the diffusivity during the run itself, which is to say, using a biased uh, climate model. And what we see, well, first off, we can add the two con uh, contributions and we can normalize it by the, the temperature change or by the, the, the sea level rise in the cases with no added diffusivity, the thing that we think is probably the, the best of, of these models.
Um, and what we're finding is that over time, this are over the course of about 200 years during the climate change run, um, there's, there's a pretty systematic signal that emerges. Initially, there's a lot of noise, and that's coming from the normalization and the fact that um, with a 1% per year per year, to, to doubling run, the climate change signal is starts off small and it, and it grows over time. But you can see something that, that becomes pretty robust and that with significant differences between heat and steric sea level rise. So basically, what this, this kind of values that they're equilibrating at suggests that if you need wanted to double the ocean heat uptake during a climate change run, you would need to add a, something of order 2.5 times 10 to the minus fourth meters squared per second, which is a pretty big value to double the heat uptake. The, the value that you would need to add to double the steric sea level rise is about 1.3 times 10 to the minus fourth meters squared per second, so about half as much. Um, put in context, we think based on the biases in the our models that we're looking at something of order 0.2 in these units. 0.2 times 10 to the minus fourth is, is the difference between the Z and the isopycnal coordinate one degree. When we go to higher resolution, we get more eddy stirring that leads to more diapycnal mixing. This is something we've seen systematically for, for some years and is well documented. And the, the value there would be something close to 0.5 times 10 to the minus fourth. So in both of these cases, we're seeing that model biases can contribute in particular to steric sea level rise. Now, the other thing we can do is we can use um, these bivariate correlations to look at how much of that signal is coming from the added diffusivity during the spin up, in other words, the initial conditions, and how much of it is the combination of the two. Now, it turns out that we had three scenarios where we let them run, um, we started them off at, at uh, basically when we changed the diffusivity, and then we had two others where we started them off 100 years after changing the diffusivity and 200 years. And so that gives us a, a way to kind of explore out to 400 years uh, of time, the relative significance of the spin up, the diffusivity during the spin up versus the diffusivity during the climate change run. And so what we're seeing here is, is that at initially, they both contributed about equally. So that the model itself is contributing um, something that's roughly comparable for the, the heat change. Uh, but over time, that decays as you've gotten further and further away from your initial conditions with a time scale of about uh, about 100 year e, e folding time scale for the heat. For the steric sea level rise, we're seeing that it's more dominated by the initial conditions, about 65% to 35%, something like that. So that would be right in here. But over and it does decay, but with a much longer time scale, something of order 500 year, uh, 400 ish years. Bear in mind that a typical climate change experiment from say 1850 to 2100 would go for about 250 years. And so over that time scale, both of these are contributing with roughly comparable uh, magnitudes. And so you have to do, if you want an accurate projection of, of steric sea level rise, you need initial conditions that reflect the state of the ocean, and you need a model that's not going to be drifting off too quickly. Um, and that's something we can illustrate here by looking at the, the relative change in the thermal expansion coefficient in two different runs. This is the low diffusivity run. We haven't added anything over the course of 200 years. And the, the fact that the, the climate is warming is increasing the thermal expansion coefficient. The second one here, we took the same initial conditions as in uh, this first run, but we're doing a control run so that we're, we're subtracting off the, the difference relative to the control run. And we're seeing that there is somewhat a larger change in the thermal expansion coefficient when we have a larger diffusivity. But if we did this relative to the control run with low diffusivity, the, the climate models drift can contribute quite significantly on timescales of order 200 years, i.e. roughly the length of a climate change experiment uh, to the, the thermal expansion coefficient right in the lower main thermocline where a lot of that heat uptake is is going on. Okay, so I'd like to circle back here at the end to this this picture of the ensemble mean biases from CMIP5. Um, again, noting that we have this warm bias. 
And the sensitivity that we worked out might be useful for estimating a correction in the ensemble mean projection. And I'm going to suggest, just based on the magnitude of the, the thermal anomalies here, which is I'm going to take as a proxy for um, added numerical diffusion that's in all of these models that changes both the thermal expansion coefficient and the heat uptake, I'm going to suggest that probably the CMIP-5 ensemble overestimates steric sea level rise by something like 20%. And this is this 20% is uh, across um, a long range of, uh, of, of time scales from, from decades out to, to a couple of centuries. Um, now, the CMIP-6 ensemble, the biases are better. Uh, we are collectively getting better at modeling climate. There are still some of these warm biases, um, but it, it may be one of the things that contributes to an improved and perhaps slightly lower projection of steric, thermosteric sea level rise uh, in these models. So the take home messages here I'd like to leave you with is um, when we're projecting steric sea level rise, it depends on how well we model the ocean, both in terms of the formulation, but also how much added mixing we're putting in. So both the underlying dynamics and things that are both parametrized or creeping in through the numerics matter. Um, it is helpful to initialize to something that's close to the observed state of the ocean, but it's not good enough to prevent the effects of drift from coming in, especially when we're looking at timescales of order 250 years. The, basically what's happening here is that when you have the right initial conditions, you're setting up the right advective pathways at first, but if you have a model that, that has biases like excessive diffusion, that those advective pathways are shifted by enough on these sorts of timescales that it, it matters for climate change projections. Um, you can try to make corrections, but there are nonlinearities in this system, in the thermal expansion coefficient and the heat and the advection, are large enough that there are limits to what you can do by just assuming that it's a linear problem and, and just trying to subtract off the biases. So I think for those of us who are involved in trying to develop better climate models, both at GFDL and at GIS, trying to do a better job of uh, constraining unphysical things that come from the numerics, but also trying to understand what controls the physical processes, there is a great deal of value in, in what we're doing for improved climate projections. And this I'd also really like to highlight, although we've I've emphasized here this kind of crude knob of just adding in diffusion, what this is saying, the fact that it's responding on these timescales, is that there's there's a great deal that we can do by adding in improved mechanistic parameterizations of diapicnal diffusivity. We know that as the stratification of the ocean is changing, that the conversion of the barotropic tides to baroclinic tides and hence to mixing changes. We know that for the same level of energy input to the turbulence, that the increasingly stratified upper ocean is going to exhibit uh, weaker diffusivity, weaker mixing. Not all of these effects are incorporated in, in all of our climate models. Um, we need to do a better job. And if we do, we can, I think, come up with, with better projections of, of steric sea level rise at the same time, what we're seeing is that the climate models are getting things order of magnitude right. We're talking about 10, 20 percent corrections. We're not talking about things that are qualitatively different. So the, the message for the public that climate change is real, climate change has been observed. We can change its rate and magnitude, especially as we go out into the century uh, later in the century is real. But the message that we do understand this pretty well, that it is order of magnitude right, despite these corrections, is also part of the important message that I think comes from this. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'd be happy to entertain uh, questions. Um, Craig, I'm going to stop sharing so I can see the uh,
see the the chat or if people want to put up their hands and and have you call on them thanks very much Bob that was uh, fascinating talk do we have any uh, questions from the, uh, the those who are listening uh this is max here uh, yeah that was a very very interesting decomposition uh, and uh yeah i had not um really appreciated of late the importance of those temperature biases on the thermal expansion coefficient contribution um so turning to the uncertainties in the actual physical processes uh as opposed to numerical slop and other climate model uh, sources of temperature error. Um, like how much leverage do you think um, that has, you know, having, having a, for example, you know, a mixing parameterization, which has this kind of uniform backgrounds value versus a very episodic sporadic one associated with the C4, C4 topography. I mean, will that will the effect of that mostly um, play itself out um, on its effect on the mean state and the thermal expansion coefficient? You think? Um, it depends on where the mixing goes. So, so part of it is we have a changing stratification. We know that the abyssal stratification, for instance, is changing as we have a tendency to shut down, say, the formation of of um, bottom waters around around the Antarctic. So there's a, a decreased stratification in the abyss, which means a decreased efficiency, if our parameterization to right, of the conversion of barotropic tides into internal tide energies. The, the internal tide energy that is going into the deep mixing probably isn't going to have a huge impact on the sort of climate change timescales, but the, the low mode internal tides that propagate away and that actually drive a lot of the mixing in, in the coasts, it could be it could be significant. And I, I don't think order one, but I'm thinking tens of percent are, are entirely plausible. Um, the easier thing is to say, OK, let's go from parameterizations that are just based on diffusivities to using things that are based on energetics. We know that mixing stratified water takes work. And it's probably a better approximation to, to put your constraints on how much energy is available to drive the mixing. And what that gives you quite directly is that as you increase the stratification for the same amount of turbulent energy being deposited and assuming the same efficiency, that the increased stratification causes the, the diffusivities to become uh, weaker. Um, and it it gets a little bit more complicated because the energy gives you the buoyancy flux, but it's the convergence of the buoyancy flux that actually drives heating. And so there, there are um, some subtleties there. But I, I think there's a, a growing body of understanding of, of how these things can be put together. Um, climate models tend to lag a bit. Climate modelers are very conservative um, and, and justifiably so. But I think that's that's something where we can we can do a better job of drawing upon the oceanographic community as a whole, uh, observational and process-based understanding, to try to pull them into into our, our our climate models that we're using for projections. But that's a great great question, Max. And, and by the way, I, I'm I'm well aware that I'm preaching to the choir on the on the need for uh, for better ocean models here. So, thanks for the question. Thank you. Do we have uh, any other questions? Well, I have an, a, another one. I, so you didn't uh, emphasize it much, but there were some interesting uh, differences in the AMOC strength among your varying uh, diffusivities. And uh, would you do you have anything further to say on you know what those different AMOC strengths were doing? Uh, yeah. To the um, to the response. So there, let's see if I, am I sharing? I'm not sharing my screen. Let's get this 
there's the AMOC strings. Um, sorry about this. I think I have to share screen and then go to presentation mode or I can't do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so these these different AMOC strings are, are redistributing heat and they play a big role in the positive feedbacks when they start melting back the ice. The, the, uh, the ice ocean feedbacks are are really prominent in why the, the planet as a whole is warming at the surface, even as, as the ocean is, is taking up heat. You can't, I can't come up with a, another way to explain it without invoking either the, the cryosphere feedbacks or the, or something to do with the clouds. The clouds seem to be about half of it, order of magnitude as we, as we kind of looked at it. But the, the, the changing strengths in the AMOC are, are part of the, the story. And, and here we're, um, thinking that this is part of the signal, we're trying not trying to differentiate it, but we there was another paper based on uh, some of these experiments, the the end states um, that uh, here I've got the citation here. Uh, Magnus Hieronymus um, took the states at the end of these runs, and and so he looked at the impact of the diffusivity on the overturning um, and that it's it's kind of a nice analysis um, half of the, the the temperature changes are associated with the increased uh, magnitude of the overturning but then there are also changes associated with the um, the fact that the ocean warms and then you get the gyre heat transport as well and so if uh, um, this okay. paper from last year is is uh, kind of a nice analysis of, of exactly the sort of questions that you're you're looking at or you're asking about thanks i'll i'll read that yeah do we have uh, any uh to, to cut out any other bits um do we have any uh further final thoughts questions comment That was great. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, really interesting talk. Thanks for. Uh, Thank you, and uh, I hope to be able to do this in person at some point in the a happier future. That would be wonderful. You're here. Yeah. Thank, okay. thank you for the nice talk. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Bob. Pleasure. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a good day.